Hi, I'm uh, Jim Rutenberg. I'm the media columnist. Um, and uh, so I report to Dean. Um, and it's been a, as you probably know, an insane year, probably the craziest year of yes. any of our careers. Yeah. Um, so I thought the best starting question is, uh, are we really the enemy of the American people? <laughs> <laughs> We're friends with Southwest no matter Shouldn't what. We Shouldn't we beat around the bush a little bit? I know, I'd love to. <clears throat> no one um, wants to do it anymore. I actually, I mean, all, all, all jokes aside, I thought that was just an outrageous um, comment by the president. I thought it was um, sort of designed to, to undermine the press. Um, of course, we're not the enemy of the people. I mean, we have a role in society, which is to ask tough questions of the president. Um, I like this relationship we have in a weird way with the president. The most natural state of affairs between the news media and the president is tension. It should be tense. We shouldn't be friendly. But I think that sweeping the press as the enemy of the people is a dangerous comment. And I think that um, it's regrettable that he felt compelled to make it. You know, and I, the cool thing about this is I get to ask you stuff that Dean's always too busy to talk to the likes of me. No, you're too, you've got a lot going on, so you're going to see me actually asking things I wanted to know. <laughs> um, so, but when that tweet came in, were you kind of as jarred by it as those of us in the newsroom were? Yeah, all those tweets. Are, I mean, my first, <clears throat> if I can go back in time just a little bit, the first of those tweets, I w it was, it was a f Friday night after the election, and we were getting pretty criticized for our um, coverage by the by the left and the right, which we'll get to. Yeah, yeah. and I, and I spent, you know, a couple days responding to critics, and then woke up Sunday morning to his first failing New York Times tweet. And I felt like the whole tone of my emails shifted dramatically. Suddenly, I was starting to get, a, to get really supportive emails. Um, I think when he does the tweets like the enemy of the people, um, it's jarring. Of course, it's jarring. Um, <clears throat> it does not influence our coverage of him. Um, that one, I think, is particularly troublesome because enemy of the people is, is a historic term in the life of, new, of American literature and politics. And it, and it implies an attitude toward us. And hopefully, it does not imply the possibility that he will do things. Um, but that's, that's, it was disturbing. And it was disturbing when I saw it and jarring. Yeah. Do you worry when that happens that um, we in the reporting staff will get too emotional about it? Because right, we're, we shouldn't be <clears throat> kind of goaded into this. Yeah. Is that something that you? I feel like one of, one of my hardest management jobs in this campaign is to make sure that the New York Times sort of holds on to its core. Not, not that reporters are trying not to hold on to their core, but, but my view, which I've said numerous times, and I'll say it again, our job is not to be the opposition to Donald Trump. It's to cover the hell out of Donald Trump. We're supposed to cover the hell out of powerful people, and he's the most powerful man in the world. Um, it's not to be, you know, his opponent. It's to it's to be tough, questioning, advocates of journalism and of our readers. So I do have to make sure the newsroom. My my message is to the newsroom is, you cannot let those tweets influence how you cover Donald Trump. You should cover the tweets. You should cover Donald Trump. But we should remember that our role is pretty clear right now. And why do you think um, he's so focused, not exclusive, exclusively on the New York Times, but it's very... But more than any other news organization. It, why do you think that is? I mean, Washington Post, like, let's throw yeah. them in here a little bit, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, the main reason is because we're better than everybody else. <laughs> oh, no. He is joking. <laughs> he is joking. <laughs> I think, I think if, I can, if I can sort of, um, you know, it's, it's always tricky psychoanalyzing people, but, I, but I'll do it anyway. I think, that, <laughs> I think that Donald Trump is a guy whose family made its fortune in Queens, which in the, in the anthropology and geography of New York is sort of an outer borough. And I think he came to Manhattan. And he really set his sights on making Manhattan. And, he, and I think he built apartment buildings probably for people who would have had trouble getting into Park Avenue buildings. Um, 
And I think that he really wanted to conquer the elite of New York. And I think in his mind, and, I'm, and again, I'm, this is tricky territory, but there's evidence to back it, the New York Times sort of represents, for better or for worse, some of the elite of New York. I don't like to think of it that way, but, but a lot of people do. And I think that it means that he wants our favor, but gets hugely angry when he can't have it. And I think, and I think that's why he singles us out for tweets. I think that's why, on the other hand, it is also why, after his election, he summoned all the networks to Trump Tower and gave them a lecture. But when it came to the New York Times, he came to us. Um, he spoke on the record. And you know he was mostly civil and polite, I think. And that is an interesting visit. But before we get to that, you know what I forgot to do, folks? <clears throat> um, if you want to submit questions, you should submit them to slido.com and hashtag. I thought hashtags were out in 2017. <laughs> No, no. Hashtag <laughs> SXSW. So just you know, put your questions in, and we'll keep going, and then we'll turn to them. But in, when he came to the office that day, right? Um, he, they tried to say what they'd done before, <clears throat> a couple days before, is so they brought the television anchors in, um, kept it off the record, and then when everyone left, they leaked to the New York Post how Trump just told them they yeah. were all assholes, yeah. right? Yeah. And. He wanted to do that with us, and we said, no, you're going to have to be on the record. That's right. And he, we almost lost the interview. That's right, which we, which we would have been more comfortable losing the interview than giving in to the way they wanted to do the interview. They wanted to, he wanted to come in <clears throat> and meet with the publisher and talk off the record. I, I, don't, I don't like, and this, this is, there's much debate about this in journalism circles, I don't believe in the editor, especially not the executive editor, doing off the record with newsmakers. I never did it with Barack Obama. I never did it with George Bush. And I, and I didn't feel comfortable doing it with him. But, but we stuck to our grounds. We said, you, you need to come to us. It's got to be on the record. And he did. And do, do you have a, why, I, I was surprised he did. Why do you think he did? I guess it goes to your point that he, he. I think he want, I mean, look, I, think, I mean, all jokes aside, and I'm not, I'm not, um, this is, I don't want this to sound arrogant, but I think, <clears throat> I think the New York Times, and historically, along with the Post, but historically, especially for New Yorkers, sets a certain kind of agenda. But I also think he's a New York guy, and the New York Times means a lot to him. Right. Were you shocked when he called us a jewel? I was shocked <clears throat> when he called us a jewel. And it, and his, I, well, I was and I wasn't. I was shocked is not the right word. He is in the, I mean, I've had three conversations with Donald Trump in my life. One, once was this meeting, another time when he came to the editorial board where I was just a visitor, because I'm not on the editorial board. And a third time was when I was a young reporter for the New York Times and I covered a court hearing and he called me after the court hearing to tell me how beautiful the story was. I think he's a, he's a salesman. I think he says, He's, he plays to his crowd. I think he sat there with an editorial board that he knew leaned left, and he said things that he thought they might want to hear. Um, he didn't actually ever, if you look at that transcript and compare it to his actions, they don't match. Right, and that's the thing that we got some heat after that, that we were, didn't go hard enough on You're him. You're talking about the second one, right? Yeah. Um, we didn't <clears throat> go hard. And there is something in part of the readership wants us to, you know, go, why aren't you being tougher on him? So there is some pressure yeah. from the other side. I think and it's, an, it's an interesting, I actually think we're, we're very tough on him. I mean, if you look at, my God, look at the, the New York Times of the last two weeks. We've run like three or four major stories about the relationship between his people and Russia. We've done a major story about the background of, um, of one of his cabinet secretaries. We've, done, we've pounded away at the Russia stuff. Um, so I, I do think we're tough. I think readers want something that I don't think is in the realm of news. I mean, I get emails from people saying, I, I got one last week from a friend who's very thoughtful who said, I understand why you have to cover him, but do you have to put his picture on the front page? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, how do you, I, I sit there and I try to write these you know, thoughtful responses, but 
the, he's the president of the United States. We have to put his, yeah, we have to put his picture on the front page. I mean, that goes to the idea that some people are talking about when his spokesman, Sean Spicer, says something that's patently false, yeah. or as other surrogates give us false information, there's again, from a certain segment of the news audience, why are you even talking to them? Cut them out. And you know, there's, a, there's a kind of movement. Yeah. Calling I, see, I think it's more important to cover this stuff and say that it's false when it's false, than to ignore it. You know? What about lies? That's my family over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I think it, I think to ignore it, just because you because it's I mean if the if the president's press secretary and the president <clears throat> say things that you can de demonstrate are false, to me co the coverage is you should demonstrate that it's false and say it. And, but there's some people, I have this, I hear this all the time in my own travels of why aren't you calling a lie a lie? We have done it. We did it. But what's your philosophy about how often we should use the word? And, and what are, <clears throat> sometimes it seems people, they wanted to hear it, right? And they wouldn't want to maybe hear it about their own candidate yeah. or person they support. Lie is a powerful word. Um, and the first time we used it was when it was on the birther issue. And I thought that was a no brainer. And I disagree with everybody who would say that that was not an instance where he could use lie. I mean, the history was he had been saying it for years. He claimed he hired a private detective who was finding out really interesting stuff. He pounded away at it, he pounded away at it, and all of a sudden he got up and said, okay, he was born in the United States. That was, in, by anybody's definition, a lie. It had intent. Um, I, don't, I, I actually think it would have been a bizarre kind of newspaper to have said that it was a false statement. Um, we've used it once or twice in, on other occasions. I think you've got to be careful. I do think you have to have some sense that it was long-standing and an intent, and that there was intent. Um, but I think when those, when those forces align, <clears throat> you should say it was a lie. Does that give, there's a certain Trump, a lot of Trump supporters who think the New York Times and the press in general, the mainstream press, has it out for him. And so when they see lie, they say, see, you, you're trying to get him. And how do we thread that needle? Because it's not, obviously not our intent. Yeah. But how do you? I mean, my response to that, and I, resp I try to respond to, to you know, thoughtful readers with thoughtful questions. First off, during the campaign, I got more heat from the Clinton campaign um, and more heat from the Sanders campaign than I did from the Trump campaign. I don't, so I guess I'm not buying that we singled him out. We aggressively investigated his business dealings, but I, I don't, I'm not buying that, um, that we were unfair to him and his campaign. We did the first story about him and his relationship with women even before the tapes came out. But I think that this, he was a candidate nobody knew anything about except for the tabloid <clears throat> stuff that had been reported. He was a candidate, nobody knew anything about his finances. We still don't know a lot about his finances. He was a candidate who refused to release his tax returns. He was a candidate who had been in and out of bankruptcy. He was a guy who a lot wasn't known about. We didn't know his business, we still don't know a lot of this by the way. But during the campaign, we didn't know his business partners. We didn't know how much debt he had. We didn't know what a, a lot financial alliances might color his judgment as a, as a president. I think we did what we were supposed to do, which is we put about 10 people on his campaign looking at everything we could find out about his finances, which is why we ended up getting a piece of his tax returns. And by the way, the piece of his tax returns showed how much he had avoided taxes for you know almost a generation, and I think that was an important disclosure. Right, one that you, that some say you should be in jail for. <laughs> right, right. Um, but that all takes resources, um, and I'm so that brings me to the here and now, uh, and I think people are concerned about this out in the world in a way I haven't seen before, and it's. People understand now that real reporting takes money, it takes yeah. people, yet our business is really um, going through such horrible change in terms of just yeah. the economic model. Can, 
do you have enough people, you're trying to hire more people, yet we're also going to face some, yeah. some downsizing, right? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that we clearly are going to have enough people. Um, we're not going to do, I mean, we have, we have been hiring like crazy since the election. We've hired three really well-known investigative reporters. We, you know, we've bulked up our White House coverage. Um, you know, we've hired more business people. We've, 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 we are preparing for the story of a generation. It is true. I mean, this, one thing I would, I would ask people to think about is, I think the next two years are going to be a historic moment in the life of news organizations. The combination of the sort of economic realities that are sort of forcing their way in, a president who is leading a, revolutionary in, a revolution in Washington that makes this the most compelling political story since, since the way the, the United States changed after 9-11, mixed in with this whole debate over what is a journalist, as this, the next two years are going to be historic. There are going to be 20 books written about the next two years in American journalism. Yes, I have to figure out a way to manage a changing economic reality of newspapers, which means, and I've said this, that the New York Times would be a little bit smaller, but emphasis on a little bit. Um, but it won't be smaller in the areas where we have to cover Donald Trump, the country, and the world. It won't, I don't, it will not be that we will do nothing to cut our ability to cover this presidency and this revolution in Washington. And we have enough dough that we Yes. Can, we, yes. Here's the, Partly. <laughs> can I stay at a nicer hotel <laughs> Monday? <laughs> but, yeah. We may not have all of our columnists after. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he fired me for this panel, but said my health care, so it's a more natural and combative interview. But my health care is still in place, Cobra. <laughs> Um, which is still $1,000 for the hour. Yeah. So, <laughs> but anyway, here's the thing that gets, that we wonder about in the newsroom is like, all right, every time Trump says you guys suck or you're the enemy, it's, <clears throat> it's, gr it's like ding, 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 yeah. ding. The subscriptions go up. And um, <laughs> it's just great, right? But then we talk amongst ourselves and we say, well, maybe that means it's a job saved or that can, can that stave off the cuts that we know are coming this year, and, the, and you want the answer to be yes, it will and your stay, eyes say yes, stay, but your I mean, it, it will stay, I mean, look, the, the harsh reality of the newspaper business, and I hate the fact that I was born at this moment in terms of the economic realities of newspapers, is adver advertising which sustained us for a long time and enabled us to big, not just the New York Times, everybody to, big these, to build these big, powerful newsrooms is disappearing. But I will say, <clears throat> that something amazing has happened, and this is why somebody should write a book about the, the last two years of journalism. The, the rise in digital subscriptions, the rise in audience, the, the literally hundreds of thousands of people who, are, who have decided to pay for the New York Times after the election, um, has changed our economics and, and makes it so that we have to cover the stories that those people want us to cover. And by the way, the stories that we want to cover too. They have altered our economics. I don't know what that looks like over two years. I think this is like this, you know, interregnum period that suddenly this, the, the picture has gotten just dramatically brighter. Um, but I think that at the end of it, you will have a big, robust New York Times with a big Washington bureau, a bigger investigative presence, a powerful way to cover Donald Trump. I have no doubt about that. Just no editors. No editors, but that's, <laughs> <clears throat> you should like that. <laughs> I wish I did, no, I, 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 I didn't I, want editors until I became an editor. Yeah, but that's why you became an editor. I, I like editors, I'm not just kissing your ass. Um, <laughs> I need extra, I need help. You know? um, but, but the answer is really, though, that while it's going to make things easier, the new subscriptions don't stave off having to do what we have to do. It doesn't make up for the they, dramatic change. In the they don't make up for it, but they help. Um, they help. I mean, I don't think anybody was, I, I, think we're, I don't think anybody expected this dramatic rise. They help. You said something in a, another interview um, that 
Trump's victory was clarifying for the mission. Yeah. And what do you mean? Like, and you said, and you mentioned something like before that you thought we'd lost our confidence, right? So what? Did yeah, you it wasn't. It wasn't co losing confidence. And I'm not, in this case, I'm not just speaking for the New York Times. I'm yeah, speaking right. For journalism, suddenly this thing happened where um, our business model got shaky. Um, our, we, we own the world through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You had to read us whether you liked us or not. And I'm not just talking about the New York Times, I'm talking about the Austin American Statesman, the Dallas Morning News, the Washington Post, everybody. The Times Picayune. The Times Picayune, where I started. Every, you had to read us. And then this thing happened where you didn't have to read us anymore, and where we sort of like, not, not lost confidence, but lost, where do we fit into this thing, right? Where do we fit into this scheme? And then in comes the most compelling presidential election of a generation, and in comes the election of a president who, no matter what you think of him, and my job is not to judge his politics, just to cover him, is revolutionizing Washington and is making changes that has the whole country just riveted. And suddenly our mission got really clear. Our mission is what it's always been, aggressive coverage of the government. Um, the one truly independent group that investigates the government without fear or favor is the press. And it just like that night of the election, one, I was wandering around the newsroom after I first realized we were all in shock because he won. I just like, I, I just levitated because I thought it is so clear what my life is going to be like for the next two or three years, and it's and it's and it's right. Right, that night was crazy. It was. <laughs> See from the dials on our screen. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned in terms of mission, though, it becoming clarifying. Um, you had said something a little bit earlier in our conversation today, this morning, that uh, what's a journalist has changed. The yeah. idea of what's a journalist has changed. Yeah. And we are now, and this goes to a question on the screen here that said, um, you know, what are we doing to combat the perception? Oh, well, this is a little different. What are we doing about fake news, the fake news right. environment? And what do you see in terms of the realm of our, some of our competitors who aren't classically trained, yeah. maybe who do dabble in conspiracy <clears throat> theories, we're living in a Facebook yeah. feed with them, and how do we differentiate ourselves yeah. in that? You know, I think, I think that the good news is there's been an explosion in, in, in people who have access and can be true journalists. That's, let, let's be clear. That may rock my economic world, but that's the best thing that's ever happened to journalism in the country. The fact that five people can get together and decide to create journalism about a very specific subject, that's terrific. Let's not kid ourselves. What makes me nervous is not everybody who does that fits my definition of journalism. And, and I've been struggling to come up with something you know, that what is Breitbart, right? BuzzFeed, obvious journalism. Breitbart, not so obvious. I'm unconvinced. Um, I think, to my way of thinking, and, and I hate the thought of the editor of the New York Times being some sort of arbiter of what is a journalism. Um, I really do. <laughs> Part of that is because that's arrogant, but, but somehow we got to wrestle with it. I think it's got, you have to be in so, some sort of honorable pursuit of the truth. The reason Breitbart is not a journalism, to my mind, they're not in an honorable pursuit of, pursuit of the truth. They're sort of a propaganda, and I look at them every day. I mean, they look for ways to twist the news to sort of match their view of the world. We make mistakes, but that's not what we do. The Washington Post makes mistakes, that's not what they do. BuzzFeed makes mistakes, that's not what they do. I think you have to be, and you can, be, you can do this from the left, you can do this from the right. Um, Bill Kristol is a journalist. Um, I think you, you have to be in some pursuit of the truth, and, you know, honorably. And I think that's, to me, that's the closest I've come to definition.
See, but that's, and it goes to a question on the screen, um, which is, is there a particular, it's Brian G, is there a particular strategy that you have adopted to combat the perception that what you report is fake news? Yeah. And it's people will say, you know, if you watch Fox, it's not even the Trumpian, yeah. your fake news, it's you're running the agenda, <clears throat> yeah. you guys at the Times. You're, right? one, one thing we've started to do is to be, and, and we're gonna do it more and more and more, is to be transparent. I think we spent our whole lives thinking that people assumed that we were honorable, people assumed that we were actually trying to find out what happened, people assumed we were expert. I think we were wrong. I mean, one of the big shocks to the system is when you learn that people don't understand that the dateline from Aleppo means that a New York Times journalist is in Aleppo risking her life to bring the news home. That, that freaks me out. The people don't realize that, you think? They don't. I think a lot of people, uh, uh, the next generation doesn't quite understand the secret language of print newspapers, right? The secret language of print newspapers, if it's one column on the right-hand side, that's the most important news of the day. If it's got a dateline from Aleppo, that means a reporter is risking her life to cover the war. I, we, we're gonna be more transparent. We're gonna let people know who our reporters are. We're gonna let them That's know great. where they are. We're gonna... <laughs> I like that. We're gonna, we're gonna let people know what it takes to get a story. And I don't mean in a way that like, beats our chest, but we're gonna let people know. And I, I, I think if people understood, we did, we, if people understand how much work it takes to try to cover war, if people understand that we are the only institution regularly in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan with a house rented and that we do everything we can to keep reporters there even as the news has faded. I think if people understand that and if we pound it home to people, I cannot believe that people will not understand that that's the difference between our news and everybody else's news. Is that what the ad campaign is partly about? We yes. did this big ad campaign, if you watch the Oscars, yes. the New York Times. Um, so it's about, is that about building subscribers or fighting back the perception that we're it's fake about, news? Or? It's about a long, creating the long-term view that what we do is different. It's creating a long-term view that we spend the money and we risk our lives to cover war. It's creating a long-term view that our brand, that it, you know, pre-exists me, that is the brand that created the Pentagon Papers, that is the brand that- Not the Post Not the movie. Post, right. <laughs> They're making a movie about the Post and the Pentagon Papers. Right. I mean, I think that, I think it's- <laughs> <laughs> They're great, we love them, we can. <laughs> I think that, I think that is, I think, I think we took for granted that people sort of knew what we did and they don't. And I think we have to really fight to make sure they know. And I think that if people know, I, I just, I refuse to believe that people will think our coverage of the war is fake news if they see a picture of Alyssa Rubin who almost lost her life, life covering refugees and, and went back to Afghanistan and wrote the stories of women in Afghanistan. I refuse to believe that people will not understand that that ain't fake news, that that's hard fought, hard won coverage. Does it concern you, by the way, we, that we can now see on our desktops how many people are reading every story we do. So we have ratings now, and I don't know if everyone understands that, that's entirely new for us. Right. When I first started at the Times 18 years ago, I could be totally snobby about television. You're doing that for ratings. You know, now we have to be yeah. concerned about ratings. And so the stories out of Syria, the stories out of Iraq, they, they don't get the traffic that anything <coughs> about Trump gets right now. That's right. Does that concern you, and will that ever put downward pressure on spending the money to have someone nope. in Afghanistan? Nope. First off, we're lucky. People actually read. <laughs> people do read about Syria. Um, people do read about war. People do read about Yemen and the U.S. You know, bombing campaign in Yemen. People do read this stuff. Um, it'll never keep us from covering this stuff. I mean, this is not a business. It's a business in the sense that it's got to be profitable, but it's a mission, and we'll never chase clicks. Um, we want to be read. If I see people are not reading our coverage of Syria, I will never ask the question. I will never say, let's not cover Syria. I will say, how do we do this so that people read it? Because remember, the mission ain't just for me and like 
10 people in the office to know we're doing it. The mission is to make sure it's read. I believe, honestly, in my bones, that the New York Times and the American press have an obligation to cover American engagement around the world. I think we have an obligation not to walk away from Afghanistan, not to walk away from, from Yemen. And if I find that people aren't reading it, it does not, it does not influence the decision to cover it. But God damn it, I'm gonna make sure we do things to make sure I will, if it takes more photography, if it takes more reporters, if it, whatever it takes, because we need that stuff to be read. Right. It's a reporter. I personally worry, like I, because now that I have them, I know that like you can't, your ego wants the clicks, right? It's not even, you don't have to say it, right? You just want, you want that. And so do you worry about stories? It's when you're in Iraq, it's, you're there, it, it's a very mission-driven reporting yeah. job. But that campaign finance story that you could do, but I don't know if anyone's gonna wanna read it. Do you worry about that, like more the mental? You know, I, I look at the, I look at quote unquote clicks a little differently. We're mental cases to begin with. You don't need any extra <laughs> thing to make us crazier. Yeah. I look at it a little differently. I guess the way I look at it is, we do do some things we don't need to do. There is a lot in American journalism that's rote, R-O-T-E. There's a lot in American journalism that's just sort of stuck in tradition. There's a lot of, you know, small bore stuff that keeps people from doing larger stuff. Um, and if I found, you know, when, I, when I, and I've run two desks and I've run another newspaper, and I've had that conversation where you say to reporters, just give me 700 words just so we could have it. Well, I didn't want that story. I was covering my ass. The reporter didn't want to do the story. And if we now learn nobody read the story, maybe you shouldn't do that story. Maybe you should take that 700 words and go write another story about, you know, what Congress is doing with the health care bill. Maybe you should take that 700 words and go write a story that's more meaningful and, and important. You will not take that 700 words and go write a crappy story just to get a couple of extra eyeballs, right? First off, that's not the business we're in. If we get in that business, we're gonna get creamed. There are many people better at that than us. Right, in the what business? The in, the, in, in the business of chasing clicks. Oh, <laughs> Did you never. want to say something else more interesting? <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> um, you know, go into a good question on the screen uh, that just moved on me. There's one, hi Dean, what is your one regret about the New York Times election coverage? That's a good one. <laughs> I'll what could you have done differently to predict the result more accurately, which we've, had, we've talked about a lot. Right? Yeah, I think we made mistakes. I mean, I've said that publicly. Um, I think, I don't think our coverage of Donald Trump was weak in any way. I mean, we, we broke the first story about, we wrote the first meaningful story about his treatment of women. We, we came up with his tax returns or a version of his tax returns. We looked at his debt, that wasn't it. I think all of the American press, with some very small exceptions, misread how much anger there was in the country and how much of a desire there was for change. If I had to go back, you know, and start the election all over again, we, did, we actually did a series called Anxiety in America, but there's no question that we would have doubled down on covering a country that really wanted change. And I, so I, don't, I, I think we could have done much better with that. Um, I also think, and we've also talked about this in the newsroom, I think we created the, this sort of meter um, the home page. The, the, at the, on the home page that showed the likelihood that Hillary Clinton would win. I think it became, it was an oversimplistic tool. Um, and I think that it, um, I, one of my colleagues said it, it made it, it was almost as if if you watched it and it was your cholesterol, <laughs> you could sit there and eat cheeseburgers and bacon and ice cream and just stare at it and think you were doing you were doing fine. It's like I'm at eighty percent. I think I'm going to have another slab of ham. And then all of a sudden it went like that, and you died. So, right. So I think. Or like this, all yes. night. Right. Yeah. So I think that I think that was that was simplistic, and I think we would do that differently. And you think it got? Do you think it got into your own reporters' heads, even who were doing the class? I mean, there's by the way, just to be clear, and there's a, there's this debate between political um, data journalism and normal yeah. journalism that should just, we should all just work together and it should go away. But 
it is true, to be fair, that our own sources, especially the establishment sources we trusted forever, said there's no, on the Republican side, yeah. this is not, this guy can't win, this will, he will not win. Election, election day, the Trump people were telling us, you know, that the question was how much he would lose by. By the way, that's no excuse for us, from my belief, we should have had a better picture of the country right. that would the, made the it less of a surprise, right? I don't, I can't, it's, it's not comforting to know that they didn't know it either. No. Because um, my job is to, I, I mean, I don't, my job is not to predict who's going to win. But I think if we had done, if we'd understood just how much, you know, after the campaign, we went in and we started getting the voices of people who voted for Trump. And it were, and I, there was, I remember kicking myself at a couple of the voices because there were some, we went in and we did a story about women um, who voted for Donald Trump despite all the things he'd said about women. And there were some very thoughtful quotes from people who said, I hated what he said about women. I don't like that. But I do think the country needs a change. And I'm willing to accept that. I'm not defending that point of view. I'm only saying I don't think we quite understood that point of view through the campaign. I don't think anybody in the press did. And I think that's one reason it was a surprise. But by the way, he did lose the popular vote. The overall national polls were not wrong. Um, but I still think wish we'd had a better handle on it. But based on your last um, answer, uh, there, what, the question that flitted off the screen was from someone who's, who wondered, it, the question read, um, are, your audience is very liberal. What are you doing to reach out to a Trump voter who could be amenable to New York yeah. Times style coverage? I, it bothers me that our audience is, is completely liberal, right? Remember, my mission, our mission is to, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, um, I'm an idealist, right? My mission is to write big stories that either explain or change the world. And if I'm only writing big stories, for a single audience that sort of had, had its own worldview anyway, that's not that great. Um, I think that we need to get better at doing some things that will attract different kinds of readers. And by the way, I don't mean by, um, by skewing our coverage. I mean, you know, I think we should get out in the country more, talk to people who may not necessarily be our readers, talk to them more respectfully, listen to them and bring their quotes home. I think there's some subjects that are easily subjects that I think we are not always as have as many reporters covering like religion. That I think that um, you know sometimes if you live in New York, I grew up in Louisiana in a very religious family, um, a very Catholic family. When I moved to New York for college, it was jarring to me how secular New York was. Um, and now that I've spent most of, more of my life in New York than I did in New Orleans, I, I think that sometimes the secular nature of New Orleans, I mean of New York, makes us not understand how important religion is in people's lives, in many, many Americans' lives. And I think sometimes we caricature religion. I think if you do all those things, get out in the country, um, cover, listen to people, surprise people, surprise people by going, showing up at places that they might not expect. I've, I'm, I've been trying to get out of New York and travel to different places too. I think that's got to have an effect. Does that mean hiring, let's, we're already trying to hire a, a more uh, ethnically, racially, uh, gender yeah. related staff, right? We want yeah. more, more of a mix, but does it also mean hiring people from other parts of the country, maybe from different Mindsets, because you don't it want does. to ask people their political preferences when you're hiring them as journalists, right? No, no, it's, it, it does. But, but you know, there, I, I think the, you know, I've talked about this. I think the, I think there's not as much elitism in the in the. Look, I grew up. Well, are you kind of elite? What am I? I mean, you were, <laughs> No, he's the opposite. He dug. He didn't dig ditches. But you, you're talking about this. I grew up in a in a working poor neighborhood in New Orleans. Um, had never been outside of New Orleans until I went away to college. You worked in your family's I worked in the bar. family's restaurant. I mopped the floor every morning before I went to school. Did you ever mop vomit? I mopped vomit. <laughs> Such a good detail <laughs> the bio. I don't, I, trust me, not only is it shocking to me that I'm considered the le leader of the elite media, 
it's shocking to my family when I go back to visit them. <laughs> I know. I love New what they, Orleans. I love what everyone says you're a lead. I'm like, tell my wife. Yeah. All right. And I mean, come I do, check. Come to our apartment. All that, all that said, all that said, look, we have, most of the st the leadership of the New York Times lives in New York, and I do think we have to work hard to get voices that are not just New York voices. Um, I, I think that we need to do that just to understand the country better. Absolutely. So to move a little more question focused on the screen, someone um, writes, this is Richard Robbins, sorry my eyesight is horrible. Isn't the press falling into a trap set by Trump's tweets to focus on his outrageous comments, especially about the media, as you're doing now, rather than his actions? I think we do both. I mean, I think if you, anybody who looks at the New York Times who doesn't think that we're like taking apart every inch of the healthcare bill, We've run like five graphics in the last three days explaining every nuance of the healthcare bill, who loses insurance, what the tax implications are. I think we've done deep, gone, dug deeply into his policies. But when the President of the United States tweets some of the things he's tweeted, you have to cover them. You have to truth test them. You just have to do both. But I don't, I don't, I guess I, I guess I push back on the idea. I mean, I, I, to be frank, I think this is somewhat true of television in a way, because they can, they're built to only manage one headline at a time. But I, I don't, I don't think anybody who looks at the New York Times, you know, and saw and has seen the giant graphics we've done on who are the people who are illegal immigrants who are in the United States? Where are they from? How old are they? I, I, don't, I think we've gone, gone really deep into the nuances of his policies, as well as covering his tweets. But because as we move toward digital, isn't it true, all that said, which I agree with, because not only because you're my boss, but partly because you're my boss. <laughs> no, no, really. Um, but we do cover tweets probably more digitally in a way. Like in the newspaper, there would have been maybe a little story about the tweet where here it could live on our home page, we could update it. You know, it's a story that's alive in a way that wouldn't have been. Right? We don't I mean, we don't cover his frivolous tweets. When he says, you know, just saw movie X, really liked it. <laughs> but I think when the, when the President of the United States accuses his predecessor with no evidence of wiretapping him, calls him a bad guy or sick, that's a story. <laughs> that's a big story. And that's a story that we have to not only cover, but keep coming back to until it's resolved. Right, because if that, when that played out, you take the same scenario two or three years ago during birtherism, and he said, I sent detectives to Hawaii. They are, yeah. Do you like the pronunciation? Yeah, that's good. They are. <laughs> They are coming up with amazing stuff, yeah. and then he never produces the, if I can use the word, dossier, yeah. and it goes away. And in this case, I mean, this is a serious crime that's been charged. So how do we deal with that internally? Like, because part of you might want to say, okay, this is frivolous, but it, to your point, it's I think, not. I think we got to, uh, look, I think part of holding powerful people to account is when powerful people say things in public. And his tweets are public utterances by the president from his own hand, especially the most volatile ones. I think we have to investigate him, truth test him, write about him. I think they're part of covering him. I think that they, to, to ignore them would be the, the most arrogant and irresponsible thing. And I suspect that if we had not covered, for instance, the Obama tweets, which are, people would have been all over us and they would have been right. Right. He, didn't, he wasn't the same kind of tweeter, to say the least. <laughs> right? um, here's a fun one, better slogan. The truth is more important now than ever, which is our new slogan, or democracy dies in darkness. I, so the Washington Post's new slogan. I think, I think that I should say that I, I love our competition with the Washington Post. I think it's great. But I actually think their slogan, Marty Baron, please forgive me for saying this, sounds like the next Batman movie. <laughs> oh, no. So I like ours Clickbait. <laughs> That's clickbait. Ugh. You know, we have to live with the consequences of that when they scoop us to Martin. They, I, I know. They, we'll scoop, they scoop us sometimes. That is the great, by the way, the, the competition between the Washington Post and the New York Times is, no, I mean, 20% of me hates it because they beat us sometimes. But 80% of me thinks, this is amazing. This is great. I mean, first off, I've worked at enough newspapers 
to want there to be as many jobs for good journalists as possible. Secondly, I think having two great news organizations fight it out day in and day out, as painful as it is when they, when they beat us, is terrific. I mean, I think it's, can you imagine if it wasn't the case, if it was only one, and, and by the way, it mainly is those two news organizations, just for the record. Um, and I, can you imagine if it wasn't, if it was only one? Or can you imagine if either one of us was not in the position to cover the story the way we're trying to cover it now? I think it would be, that's an unimaginable state of affairs. You feel like there are only two news organizations? I think that, <laughs> I think that, not, I think that there are two news organizations that are breaking the biggest stories. I think CNN, ha, CNN has broken some really good stories. The Journal has had. I, do, I think the Journal has had some too. But I think if you made a list, look, um, the Wall Street Journal is a great newspaper. CNN is a great news organization. What I meant is, I don't think anybody would disagree that if you made a list of the biggest stories that have been broken over the last year, they were broken by the New York Times or the Post. Do you and Marty ever call each other like, oh, you got me on that one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we don't, and, it, and I, <laughs> <laughs> I, sh I, it's always, nobody ever believes this, because it seems, Mar I, I, Marty Barron, it, we used to work together at the New York Times, and he is like one of my best friends. Um, but I hate it when he beats me. I'm sure he hates it when I beat him. Um, so we don't have, we have dinner occasionally and we go to art galleries sometimes, but we don't have that conversation. Art galleries. Yeah. That is so dignified. We're elite. We're the media elite. <laughs> <laughs> we go to art galleries and we stream through the galleries with hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> Marty speaks French. While the rest of us, <laughs> that is, you, do you probably do too, right? I do not speak French. Well, just for the record. Marty doesn't either, but he speaks Spanish. Th just for the record, your staff, we're the ones vomiting in the bar. Okay? <laughs> so uh, here's another one. Clickbait headlines is a huge all caps. Uh, who wrote that? It's a Trump? Clickbait headlines are huge. It's a huge dr <laughs> driver of post-truth in all media outlets, NYT included. This person says, is the NYT striving to restore trust in media and its own clickbait? I don't buy that one, you know? I mean, I, look, I, I, I think it's clear that I own up to our screw-ups, right? But I, I, don't, I don't think that we, I mean, do we do things that I regret? We put out 200 stories a day. Do we do things that I look at sometimes at night or in the morning and cringe and say, oh God, how did that one happen? Which one did that? Sure. What is that? <laughs> And I, but I think that, I, don't, I just don't think we're driven by clickbait, I don't. I think we're driven by like trying to do good stories and I think sometimes we screw up. It's a, there's nothing more, there's nothing more um, um, vulnerable, it's not the word, right word, there's nothing, I mean newspapers are deeply flawed. They are, you know, in my case, 1,300 people striving to put out a news report every day on different platforms. Nobody can watch the whole thing. Sometimes I walk past the, you know, the news desk and I see a headline emerging and I say, holy shit. And, <laughs> and sometimes I see things in the paper the next day I don't like. It's like, it's a, that's the way it's gotta be. What you have to do is hold on to the fact that you're striving for truth and that you're doing your goddamn best and on the biggest stories that doesn't happen. But we are, the interesting thing to me is there isn't, and so just a, a small side point is there is an art that kind of is dying, right? In terms of um, not only democracy dies in darkness, but beautiful headline writing dies in the digital world, right? Like, you know, because I don't, it's everything's done to get clicks. It, it's not, not as it's bait. Not, it's not, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think, I think headline, print headlines are different from digital headlines, not, not just to gain eyeballs, Print headlines had this architecture around them, right? Like so, you know, you're looking at the print front page, there's a picture at the bottom of the page from a, you know, of a tank moving through Aleppo, and the headline's not that important. It's sitting there with the tank moving through Aleppo, it's got this sort of architecture that tells you what the story is about. Some people don't even read headlines. You see tank, Aleppo, you know, Aleppo, Dateline, I'm reading about Aleppo. 
digital headlines are different. They have to do more work. They don't have that sort of architecture to guide you to it. So you do have to write them differently. You do have to tell people more, and they have to be snappier. It's true. And that leads, there's a question here um, from, uh, I can't, Vaish. Are there any alternate forms of content display that the MIT is experimenting with, like bringing context slash timeline uh, kind of easier to consume to totally, mobile. and we are right. Oh, totally. We do things now that would have uh, would have been un. We do more chronologies. We do more timelines. We do more, just sort of, you know, Q and A's. Things we would have done as stories before. We now do as Q and A's. Can I do my column tomorrow as a drawing? No. <laughs> <laughs> that day is gonna give suck, it a shot. Man. Go ahead. I right, so hope you guys have fun at South by. I'll be right <laughs> um, <laughs> Here's an interesting one. Do you think, and this is from Satu, I'm gonna, I'm gonna manga your last Do name. Do you think Trump will be removed from office before the end of his term? <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any way to, I, I think you have to cover him with the assumption that that's not gonna happen. I don't, I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> All right, there you have it. That's a pretty, that's, we can't go anywhere from there. Um, <laughs> how many new subscribers, this is from OK Arts. Uh, how many, sorry to mangle that, how many new subscribers has the MIT gained since the election of Trump? It's in the hundreds of thousands. I literally don't remember the exact number, and you have to remember subscriptions go up every day. It's a ton. I mean, it's an astounding, it's in hundreds of thousands. And, and the, the second part of the question was, where do you see it going from there? Continuing to go up. Um, we need it to go up a lot. We still, need it right? to go up a lot. Buy more. We need it to go up a lot. Which is th this question from Anonymous. I, the hacker group? Uh, <laughs> how can we meaningfully support the free press and accurate reporting outside of buying subscriptions? Why, thank you, Anonymous. <laughs> um, outside, of, outside of buying subscriptions. I think that there are a lot of not-for-profit news organizations that could use funding. The New York Times itself, by the way, um, is trying to figure out new ways to attract different kinds of funding beyond the subscriptions and, and advertising. Um, like but selling think, toasters? Selling toasters. No, I think, I, think there are, I think there are things that you can do to support journalists. I mean, I think giving money to ProPublica, I think buying subscriptions to the New York Times, I think the New York Times is trying to figure, a lot of people have come to us and said, a lot of philanthropies, we would like to help you. Huh. And I think if there's a way for us to, if, if there's a way for us to do that without, you know, jeopardizing our coverage and with us keeping control of our coverage, I would be willing to think about that. But that gets dicey, right? Because who's their funding and what's yeah, the Yeah, it does. Angle? But on, on the other hand, you know, there are, there are groups that fund coverage of climate change, and outside of the head of the EPA, there ain't much debate over the causes of climate change. Are you start speaking about Mr. Pruitt? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think most, I think that's settled science. So if you know, I'm, I'm, if 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 there was a way to fund a project to look at climate change and its impact all over the world in a dramatically visual storytelling way, I think that would be a public service. But is there a way, but I think to this, another part of that question, if it's settled science, is there a way that that needs to be pounded through the news feeds that, you know, among hoax stories or yeah. people denying it or, yeah. you know, legitimate? Yeah, I mean, every, st every time we write about when, when, when he made his remarks, we make clear that it's settled science. We, you know, do stories the next day that says, "Here's why it's settled science." We quote, si we quote scientists describing why it's settled science. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Mark Fridson: uh, How do you counter the president's attempt to diminish the media's credibility so he can successfully reduce his accountability by getting people to tune out? I, I do think. I do think that the president has, has had as his practice to try to reduce the credibility of independent institutions. It's not just the press. It's been the judiciary. Um, it's been members of Congress who question him. Um, I think that's true. But I think you counter it, to be frank, 
by blocking and tackling, aggressive reporting, reporting that um, you know that makes clear when when the truth is different. Um, I think you just do it by continuing to report and break stories and make yourself indispensable. And that leads perfectly to another question here is um, regardless of whether Breitbart is real or not, the president is getting his information from there. What are the implications of that for our country? I think he also gets his information from the New York Times. I mean, I, his tweets are in the morning after reading the New York Times. I think if he only got his information from Breitbart, that would be pretty bad. What about Infowars.com? That would be worse. <laughs> that would be worse. I mean, those are, those are not journalistic institutions. I know they're going to all, there are probably good journalists there who will get upset, but they're not journalistic institutions. Um, they're just not. Um, but he reads the New York Times, too. And I suspect now that he's in Washington, he reads the Washington Post. So he gets his information from elsewhere, too. But there is something going on here, right, that is, is a shift when the president can point to something that might have been an Infowars with his megaphone that does kind of, we have to live in that world as journalists, right? We have to live in that world as journalists. And I think that that's disconcerting. That's when I talked in the very beginning about why we have to struggle with some definition of what is journalism without being arrogant. I mean, look, the, the, when the press secretary starts treating, you know, I mean, one of the most bizarre scenes that's happened a day or two ago was in Infowars that, the, that was, who was, at, who was at the press briefing and was attacked by the Fox reporter? Oh, that was gatewaypundit.com. Okay. Gateway, sorry, sorry, Infowars. Hashtag. That was a Gateway Pundit, which is sort of a, a website that advances conspiracy theories, has been given a seat in the White House press gallery. That's, a, that's ridiculous, you know? Um, and there was the amazing scene of Fox's White House reporter attacking that guy and saying he didn't deserve to be there, which he didn't deserve to be there. And then Fox got it to the Fox reporter got attacked for being a member of the liberal Yeah, that's media. right. That's like, that's, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's where we are in this sort of ridiculous definition of, but by the way, um, I mean, <laughs> I don't want it to sound like we should control who covers White House press briefings. I mean, I we, they should be, that should be wide open. But I don't think publications that advance conspiracy theories with no, you know, whether they're on the right or the left, with no backing, that's just not journalism. Um, so here's one anonymous again. Uh, you are, this guy's love, you, you are admittedly a liberal leaning paper, admittedly. You can answer that part of it too. How do you answer the charge that you buried negative stories about Hillary, previewing debate questions, et cetera? I don't think we, first off, the, 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 the most criticism I got before and after the campaign were for, was from the Clinton people, who thought we were too tough on her, who thought we spent too much time writing about the, um, her emails. And I don't, I don't think we buried that story. I think that we came to that, we fronted that, so we put that story on the front page. I think a couple days after it broke. Which one? The um, this was the questions. story about the questions being. I assume that's what that's what yeah. they're. Um, yeah. Um, the story about Donna Brazil sort of pre-reviewing questions. We did. We didn't break the story, and probably were a beat slow on it because we didn't break it. That's that's what happens sometimes. We sh probably should have fronted it the day before, but we did front it and report it out. So that was a front page story. Cause I get that a lot. It's like, you didn't cover. Well, Google it, and you, you maybe yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. I mean, we, we, I mean, we spent, you know, one of the criticisms we get is you didn't write about Hillary Clinton's role in Benghazi. David Kirkpatrick, who, I was, who was our great reporter in the region, interviewed people who, who participated in it. We did a two-part series sprawling over about four pages and essentially, we concluded that the people who said there was some sort of cover-up were that that was false. When we reported that while there were some mistakes made in the, in America's policy toward Libya that contributed to it, that it was a much more nuanced and deeper story. And to be perfectly frank, it was also a story that showed that she was a strong Secretary of State. I mean, the reporting the reporting is the reporting, right? Right. And the people who the people who make it up and believe in conspiracy theories did not go to Libya, and we did. So we, 
they were <laughs> so because we are running out of time I'll ask a, I think a, a, this will be a fast one what's more important being first or being right in a world of real-time notifications on our phones how does the MIT balance accuracy versus immediacy being right is much more important um, but this is, this is really hard in the era we're in. In the era I, I grew up in as a reporter, you covered a press conference at 10 o'clock, you went back to the office. Had a martini. Calls, I, <laughs> <laughs> okay. you, went, you, went, you went back to the office, you made calls, and you filed a story at 6.30, 7 o'clock. Um, if, the, if the president has a press conference at 10 a.m., the reader has an expectation, an understandable one, because that's news that they're gonna know about it at 10.05. Does that invite more mistakes? Yes, of course it does. But what you get in exchange for that is, is, is an, an, immediate, an immediacy that's really valuable when you're covering news. Now, we just got a sign that said over time, so I guess time is over. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. You're good.